Dr. Yusuf al -Jarma. I'm delighted to welcome you to Mindful. Thank you so much for joining us. I wanted to say a few words of introduction. Uh, Dr. al is has, holds a doctoral degree in expressive arts therapy. He has been on our faculty and on our leadership team for a number of years now. Uh, you direct our expressive arts emphasis within our uh, counseling department. I think if you mention that you're an expressive arts therapist, a smaller group in the world mm -hmm. understands your field. I wonder if we could just start out by talking about your field and mm -hmm. defining it. So expressive arts therapy as a field, uh, it's not an an old field if you want. It's, uh, I'd say it's a middle age now field. It's uh, about 42 years um, or 45 years in the 40s, if you want, uh, that started actually here in Boston as a response to the need for more uh, therapies that reflect and use the arts, integrate the arts in therapy. Art therapy, music therapy, psychodrama, those are well-established fields that some of them started in the 20s. In the 40s, art therapy and other uh, field started, but there was not one field that combined all the arts together. Um, so a group of people thought about expressive arts and having a collective expressive arts uh, field. And the premise that you don't have to be an artist or a musician or a dramatist to be able to practice expressive arts, but you really need to have some kind of background in the field of psychology and counseling in order to be able to sit with one-on-one -on -one or running groups. In around the world, there are a few schools that give a master degree in expressive arts, and we are one of them. I would say there are a handful of schools, uh, not many schools. Um, and many of them were established maybe in the last 10 years or 20 years. Uh, so it's not a long time ago, but it's still fresh. But there are so much research and evidence-based practices that happen with expressive arts and how important it is for people. Uh, within the International Expressive Arts Therapy Association that um, we try to bring all the expressive arts therapists and artists around the world to one organization. If you think about the arts organizations, it's one that hold the international model. So uh, a few years ago, we, hold, we held our uh, biannual conference in Hong Kong. Before that was in Peru. Uh, we had the symposium in Guatemala. This year uh, will be in Canada. And we have local conferences also happening in, in the United States as well. So if someone was interested in this field and they have a bachelor's degree, mm -hmm. what are the paths towards training and licensure? Mm -hmm. And then what does the job market look like? The, our program is structured in a way that people can do it in two years, uh, in a full time or three years as a part time. It's a 60 credit uh, program. It's a state um, Licensure in Massachusetts, so people who finish our program will be able to uh, pursue to become licensed mental health counselor after they do the uh, the post grad work, um, and then they also can apply to become registered expressive arts therapists. Our alums are finding most of their, it's like in this area, I would say community organizations is a big thing, uh, places that deal with trauma, uh, residential places, schools, hospitals, outpatients, places. So it's the same places that any other counselor, social worker, or psychologist actually will be applying to. And our, actually our grads or uh, our alums are more competitive than other, if you want, fields, because they hold both that psychology counseling background and the expressive arts. So I'm eager to turn now to, to uh, an important part of your professional focus, mm -hmm. which is using expressive arts therapy in the treatment of trauma. Mm -hmm. um, I think what could really bring this alive is if we could start with an example of how you've worked in a community that's experienced trauma mm -hmm. or with an individual mm -hmm. and how you go about thinking about how to use your uh, professional craft to work with that community or individual. Mm -hmm. My bachelor degree was in social work and psychology and uh, the training of social work in Palestine 
I would say that time was not the same as training social workers in this country. Uh, it's more, if you're a social worker, you actually, you are a therapist, you are doing therapy. And I was required uh, to do a practicum, actually an internship, while I was an undergrad. Uh, so I had to work uh, both the first, um, internship I did was with children, so it was uh, child focus, and then the second one was with adults. So the first one, most of the cases I would get with kids, uh, those are kids five years and under, who has some kind of bedwetting problem or behavioral problems, but there are underlying trauma reason behind them. So uh, the kid who's still wetting his bed is really because he was witnessing some kind of violence. But it, it was very hard to talk with that kid about the trauma or tell me how do you feel. Uh, and I would go nowhere with those kids. Like I would sit one on one and it's like, uh, how are you? Do what, why you are here? It's like, I don't know. It's like, do you want to tell me anything? It's like, no, I don't know. My mom wants me to be here and here I am. And I was like stuck all the time. Where I, where can I go with those kids? Talk therapy is not working, uh, going anywhere with those kids. And she said, have you ever tried arts? And I looked at her, it's like, that's not therapy. That's something that only crazy people do. Uh, and she said, no, it is therapy. Because again, this back in the... 1990s, beginning of 1990s, art was not a big thing in Palestine. So that was, was a crazy idea or uh, an idea that maybe work, maybe will not work. So I said, okay, I'll try it, I'll give it a chance. And I uh, was sitting with one of the kids and it's like, you wanna draw? And the kid, yes, yeah. And that kid ended up drawing his life story of how he was witnessing violence. So we'll do arts and more arts and he will be, he will actually will look forward to come back to the session, which was, uh, for me, it was like, wow, that's really work. Uh, then when I finished, I was looking for more. It's like, yes, I know how to ask people to draw. I know how to ask people to write, but I don't know anything about what is this called, a group of Palestinians were introduced to expressive arts by an Israeli psychodramatist who used to teach at the European Graduate School in Switzerland where I got my um, my master's degree and he offered to come and have a cohort at one of the centers in Jerusalem and teach uh, us and then we will have the opportunity to go to Switzerland to do our master's degree and we all jumped on the experience and the opportunity because it's like here we are nobody else ever done this and it is really working and the timing of that was also very sensitive because was after this like during the second intifada so many of the counselors therapists expressive arts therapists teachers got together after uh, uh, that what happened in the second intifada and they were brainstorming what they should be doing and people jump in that opportunity so we were doing that, we were able to reach thousands and thousands of kids during very short time um, and was really effective. Uh, and actually it continued from that time to this day, there are more and more expressive arts work happening in Palestine. So it, it's one of those fields that people can, you can reach people very quickly and very effectively in a short time. And people can continue that. Uh, just like working the personal trainer, if you, if that personal trainer is not there, then you stop doing that. Versus the arts, you are doing it, and you think that it works, and then you continue doing the arts in your own. Seven or eight Syrian refugee mm -hmm. families that the mm -hmm. State Department has helped move into our western suburbs. Yeah, and I'm thinking about the tremendous utility of working with the. I think there's 17 children now. Yeah, but the point is that these children are just learning English. Mm -hmm. And to be able to use these modalities with when you don't share a language mm -hmm. has a particular power. Yeah. So Michelle Nabili, one of my colleagues here, who also uh, work in the, our expressive arts emphasis, we work together and we are developing uh, some indigenous methodology uh, work that we will be uh, implementing and uh, offering to other people, which m help people to use whatever the culture 
is is needing in a way and it's a cultural based cultural sensitive work that we do a number of years back i was in haiti with another colleagues from here and we were doing expressive arts with the kids and the families and the teachers and uh, it was really nice to see the effect and even though i did not speak the language but I was able to sit in the ground and do a tree of life with other uh, kids. So you don't have to know the language in order to be uh, good expressive artists or to use the arts in therapy. So with those families, I remember one of the kids that a co-therapist worked with, with a kid. He actually, she actually went with him to his preschool and was shadowing her for him for almost a week, doing art with him, play, uh, he, even though he did not speak the language, but by the end of the first week he was, he told her, I'm good to go by myself here. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the, art, of the arts and how that relationship. She actually uh, it created a, a photo album for him. So she took different pictures with him, of him playing with the kids and in the placement, in, in the preschool. And he created that and gave it to him as a, pres as a present. And any times like he misses his family or he misses his friend, here's the picture album, you can go back to him. And I witnessed also the sisters being involved with many of the arts programming in how much that also what was help where it was helpful for both of them as well so I very much appreciate the opportunity to talk today I wish we had more time because it's been a fascinating conversation mm -hmm. as we're wrapping up is there a, a take-home point you'd like to make before we uh, we finish I came to William James College seven years ago now and uh, being here I would say it's the highlight of my career because I have been able to do my own research, which involved expressive arts and resilience. I have been able to apply the expressive arts in, with different population, as I mentioned, with the Haitian population in Guatemala, going to different conferences. I have been, I find it very supportive to be here and was, I still, getting the support I need from administration to go to conferences and to build on my experience of using the arts in therapy. Um, so I, this place has been home for me. Anybody or any prospective students or anybody who wants to work here or come to school here, I think they will find it the same way. It's, it's a family and a family that will look out for you and will help you throughout the way. I think our mission um, as William James College meet, meeting the needs is really what we do and that's what I found in the last seven years that our school is doing that and helping underserved communities and start striving to really help other people to be here. Uh, I would thank any student or any applicants or uh, somebody who needs to know more about the arts or know about the school should come and visit. We all have an open door policy and uh, students are welcome and people are welcome to come and come and chat with us. Well, we are very fortunate to have you on our team. Many thanks. For more information about the faculty members interviewed today and the topic of discussion, please follow these links.